This is Space Time, Series 23, Episode 40. Coming up on Space Time. When worlds collide, the titanic collision of two asteroids. Why NASA chose Jezero Crater for the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover mission. And it seems belief in UFOs and alien abductions are falling because, well, people have more important things to worry about right now. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have observed an expanding cloud of icy debris caused by the catastrophic collision of two asteroids in a nearby star system. The debris cloud was originally thought to be an exoplanet, orbiting the bright star Formaholt, located some 25 light years away. The object, previously believed to be the planet Formaholt B, was first announced in 2008, based on data taken in 2004 and 2006. But a report in the Journal of the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences claims new observations using the Hubble Space Telescope show that what astronomers originally thought was a planet has now seemingly vanished from sight and instead replaced by a cloud of very fine dust particles. While there's been heaps of evidence of similar asteroid collisions in other systems, nothing of this magnitude has ever been observed before. The study's lead author, Andreas Gaspar, from the University of Arizona Stewart Observatory, says that makes this a big deal. It means it's really a kind of blueprint for how planets destroy each other. Former Holt B was clearly visible in several years of Hubble observations that revealed it as a moving dot. But unlike other directly imaged exoplanets, nagging puzzles with Former Holt B arose early on. For example, the object was unusually bright in visible light, but it didn't have any detectable infrared heat signature. At the time, astronomers hypothesized that this added brightness may have come from a huge shell or ring of dust encircling the planet that may have been the result of some sort of collision. Another problem was that early Hubble observations suggested the object wasn't following a normal elliptical orbit around the star, as planets usually do. So the authors analyzed all the available archival Hubble data on former Holt B, including the most recent images taken by Hubble. And when everything's combined, it reveals several characteristics that paint a picture that this planet-sized object may never have existed in the first place. In fact, Hubble images from 2014 showed that the object had vanished, much to the disbelief of astronomers. Adding to the mystery were earlier images showing the object was continuously fading over time. Gaspar says former Holt B was clearly doing things that a planet should not be doing. So, with all the evidence, the authors have now concluded that former Holt B was not a planet at all, but rather a slowly expanding cloud blasted into space as a result of a collision between two large bodies. Researchers believe the collision probably occurred not long prior to the first observations taken back in 2004. By now, the dust cloud, consisting of particles around a micron in size, is well below Hubble's detection limit. Now, the other key point, of course, was that this object wasn't on an elliptical orbit, as expected for planets, but it seemed to be on an escape trajectory, in other words, a hyperbolic path. Gaspar says a recently created massive dust cloud experiencing considerable radiative forces from the central star Formaholt would be placed on just such a trajectory. Because Formaholt B is presently inside a vast ring of icy debris encircling the host star, the colliding bodies were likely a mixture of ice and dust, similar to the Kuiper Belt objects which orbit the Sun out beyond Neptune in our own solar system. The authors estimate that each of the bodies involved in this cataclysmic collision would have been around 200 kilometers across. And they also suggest that the former hot system could well be experiencing similar collision events of this type every 200,000 or so years. A clear case of worlds colliding. This is Space Time. Still to come. Why NASA chose Jezero Crater for the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover mission. And it seems belief in UFOs and alien abductions are falling because, well, people have more important things to worry about right now. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Well, as we mentioned last week, preparations are continuing at the Kennedy Space Center at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida for July's planned launch of the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover aboard an Atlas V rocket. 
the 2005 kilogram six-wheeled car size mobile laboratory will arrive on Mars in February, landing in Jezero Crater. The mission will study the local geology and search for signs of past or maybe even present life on the Red Planet, which is why Jezero Crater was chosen. Jezero's selection was the culmination of a five-year search looking at more than 60 candidate locations. Jezero Craters located on the western edge of the Isidius Planetia, a giant impact basin just north of the Martian equator. Western Isidius presents some of the oldest and most scientifically interesting landscapes Mars has to offer. The landing site has geologically rich terrain, with landforms reaching as far back as 3.6 billion years, which could potentially answer important questions about planetary evolution and even astrobiology. Mission scientists believe the 45-kilometre-wide crater, once home to an ancient river delta, could have collected and preserved ancient organic molecules and other potential signs of microbial life from the water and sediments that would have flowed into the crater billions of years ago. In fact, Jezero's ancient Lake Delta system offers many promising sampling targets of at least five kinds of rocks, including clays and carbonates that have a high potential to preserve signatures of past life. In addition, all these materials being carried into the delta from what was a very large watershed could contain a wide variety of minerals both from inside and outside the crater. And that's important because one of the mission's goals will involve collecting rock and soil samples and storing them in a cache on the red planet's surface, with NASA and the European Space Agency looking at future sample return mission concepts to retrieve these samples and bring them back home to Earth. The geologic diversity that makes Jezero so appealing for mission scientists also makes it a challenge for the team's EDL, or Entry, Descent and Landing team, who are charged with the difficult job of flying the rover down to the surface, or at least pre-program it to do so while still trying to take account of all possible contingencies. Along with the massive nearby river delta and small crater impact sites, the landing site also contains numerous boulders and rocks to the east, cliffs to the west, and depressions filled with sand dunes that could easily bog the rover. Mars 2020 rover project scientist Ken Farley from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, says the Mars community has long coveted the scientific value of sites such as Jezero Crater, and a previous mission even contemplated going there. But the challenges for safely landing on the site were simply considered too prohibitive. But thanks to modern technologies, what was once out of reach is now conceivable. When the landing site search began, mission engineers had already refined the landing system to the extent whereby they could reduce the Mars 2020 landing zone to an area 50% smaller than what was needed for its twin Mars Curiosity rover, which landed in Gale Crater back in 2012. And this allowed the science community to consider more challenging landing sites. Among the critical science instruments aboard the 2020 Perseverance rover is SuperCam, which includes a telescope with a laser unit mounted atop a mast and a spectrometer mounted inside the body of the rover. SuperCam's principal investigator, Roger Weens, from the Los Alamos National Laboratory, says the system works with a laser blasting a tiny portion of a geological formation, say a rock or soil sample, thereby creating a plasma. The telescope then captures the spectra of the light emitted by the plasma, and that's passed onto the spectrometer to determine its elemental and molecular composition, as well as physical properties like hardness. SuperCam is basically a geological observatory on the Mars 2020 rover. We have a telescope that sits on the mast of the rover, and out of that telescope we fire laser pulses to interrogate rocks and soils, and then using that we actually have several techniques that this uh, instrument observatory uses to understand the composition of the rocks both chemically and mineralogically and physical properties like their hardness. We were uh, chosen to build this instrument from the ground up following, to some extent, the successful ChemCam instrument that is exploring Mars since 2012 on the Curiosity rover. We have been uh, developing this instrument in partnership with the French Space Agency and an organization, uh, IRAP, in Toulouse, France, and with uh, some Spanish colleagues as well. And so the the whole consortium is led by Los Alamos to make sure that spacecraft instruments survive. We have to give them a a barrage of tests, environmental tests as well as performance tests. Some of the environmental tests are vibration tests to make sure they survive the launch, thermal tests to make sure they will work well at cold and hot temperatures, and then also in a vacuum or in this case in the Mars atmosphere. 
After all of the environmental tests, then we give it uh, the performance testing to understand how well do the spectra work, how well does the imaging work, the microphone, does it work? So we've tested that as well. This is the voice of Roger Weeps speaking to you through the Mars microphone on Supercam. And so we've completed that testing and we're ready to send this instrument off to Jet Propulsion Laboratory to get bolted onto the rover. This launch will take place in, in late July of 2020. It then takes about nine months to get to Mars. So we're heading for a landing on February 18, 2021. That's Roger Weens, the SuperCam Principal Investigator with the Los Alamos National Laboratory. And this is Space Time. Still to come, belief in UFOs and alien abductions are falling because people have more important things these days to worry about. And later in the science report, growing concerns that the COVID-19 virus can be spread simply through breathing and talking. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Okay, let's take a break from our show for a word from our sponsor, ExpressVPN, rated number one by Tech Radar. You may be wondering why you need a virtual private network. Well, it's in the name. It's all about privacy. Do you really want big brother tech companies, hackers, governments, and who knows who else snooping in on your online activities? Now, you might not have anything to hide, but it's still really creepy, and it could be dangerous for you and those you care about. Also, how often do you run across a website and you want to get information from it, but you find out that they're geo-blocked? It's all very frustrating, and it's becoming an increasing problem. And that's where ExpressVPN can help you. ExpressVPN's a simple and efficient way to protect your online privacy. It's internet without borders from the world's leading VPN provider. So, protect your online privacy today. And find out how you can get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash space. That's tryexpressvpn.com slash space for three months free with a one-year package. Visit tryexpressvpn.com slash space to learn more. And of course, you'll find the link details in the show notes and on our website. That's tryexpressvpn.com slash space. And now, it's back to our show. You're listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Belief in extraterrestrial life and aliens visiting Earth in flying saucers to engage in a bit of late-night probing has been a mainstay for science fiction for well over a hundred years, and it's been in the human psyche for much longer than that. In fact, you can go back thousands of years to passages from the prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament of the Judeo-Christian Bible, referring to strange heavenly visions of cherubs with four faces and machines that appeared as wheels within wheels with rims full of eyes. Then there's the story of fiery discs seen in the sky by the pharaoh Thutmosis III. I guess the modern-day UFO era probably began with pilot Keith Arnold's UFO sightings near Mount Rainier in Washington State. That was also the first time the term flying discs or flying saucers was used. By the way, that sighting? Well, that's now believed to have been a squadron of early Air Force jets. Of course, there's the famous 1947 Roswell incident, apparently involving the crash of an alien spacecraft in New Mexico. More likely, the crash of a secret military black ops project, although probably not the Project Mogul balloon train often talked about. Then, in 1961, came the case of Betty and Barney Hill, who claimed to have witnessed odd lights and experienced missing time and lost memories while driving home through New Hampshire. Later regressive hypnosis therapy unearthed stories of alien abductions and strange experiments which have since been attributed to the accidental implanting of false memories by the hypnotist and because of Betty Hill's pre-existing fascination with UFOs. And of course, there's one of my favourite, the Kecksburg incident in Pennsylvania in 1965, when a UFO, now known to have been the Soviet Union's Cosmos 96 Venera spacecraft, caused widespread panic when it crashed in local woods after a failed launch earlier from the Baikonur Cosmodrome placed it in a decaying orbit. But these days, there are far fewer new stories about. And that's because the number of people who believe in UFOs and alien abductions appears to be steadily declining. 
To find out more, Andrew Duckley is speaking with astronomer Professor Fred Watson. We're going to look into this uh, phenomenon of alien abductions. This has been the subject of movies, documentaries, TV shows for years and years and years with so many people claiming to have been abducted by little grey aliens and of course we know about the Roswell incident. What's happening at the moment is that the, the reports of alien abductions are down rather drastically apparently and uh, that makes um, one wonder what's going on. Now, the jury's out. I, I, I tend to think that this is some sort of uh, hysteria type of situation, but the people who, who claim these things have happened are incredibly convincing and obviously truly believe what happened was an alien abduction. So I don't know where we start with this one. What, <laughs> what's your take on it? Over to you, Fred. I'm going to start with uh, by acknowledging the Boston Globe, who, who've done this um, investigation. One of their investigative journalists has looked at this. It's a very nice story. Uh, so there's a, a number of statistics that are quite surprising, I think. One is that, and this uh, is actually a rather old poll done by National Geographic, but apparently 77% of Americans believe that aliens have visited the Earth, mm. which is a colossal number. Yes. And 30 percent of Americans believe that the government has covered up evidence of alien visitation. That's a, a more recent poll. These are very, very high statistics. And then another poll in the UK showed that one in 25 of the respondents who, uh, who came back to this poll believed they'd been abducted by aliens. Uh, that was in 2014. Mm. So it's an incredibly popular idea that, that aliens have been around, that they've actually taken people away and brought them back. And, and it, I think the history of that goes back to 1961, when there was something that's very a very famous case uh, within the alien abduction community uh, of Betty and Barney Hill, who... Uh, I read the story. Mm. Yes, that's right. <laughs> I thought something was following in, them in the car and then found themselves 30 miles away or something with no memory of what had actually happened. But regressive hypnosis demonstrated that they went through all kinds of interesting things. And the whole alien abduction, well, fad, I guess, is what you'd call it, yeah. grew from there. And, of course, movies, books, the whole oh, deal. Yeah. Popular things. So the sober voice of this story comes from people like uh, a Dr. Chris French, who's is actually at Goldsmiths College in London. I love the name of the department that he heads up. It's the Anomalistic Psychology Department. Oh, how cool is that? Yeah, absolutely. That's where great... do you work? I work at the Anomalistic something something. <laughs> I couldn't remember the rest of it already. Yeah, Anomalistic Psychology Department. Mm. Uh, we should have one of those here. And you know, a lot of Studies, of course, relate these things to phenomena which go on in our brain. The fact that the number of reported abductions seems to have fallen is what they're really interested in, because that really comes about by, OK, what are the things that concern people now and what are the things that are uppermost in our thoughts and imaginations as we conduct our day-to-day -day lives? And also with, well, things like anomalistic psychology, yeah. uh, that sort of thing. How does that play into it? Uh, so there, there is essentially a reduction, as you said in the headline, a reduction of these so-called abductions. And one of the reasons that's being put down for this is actually... The internet. And you might think it would work the other way. Yeah, well, I was going to say, I mean, it's just chock full of garbage. I mean, <laughs> well, sure, surely right. that would increase the numbers, but yeah, so, do tell. Yeah, so the theory is that because of the way we communicate with each other these days, uh, which is very different from what it was like in the 60s, when there were three radio stations and two TV stations, certainly in the UK, mm. that's the way it was in the early 60s anyway. So everybody was watching the same stuff. Nowadays, we've got a completely fragmented media scene. And the theory is that some of these, the people who, who are interested in alien abductions and, and who believe they might have been abducted, really keep themselves to themselves. They 
they talk to like-minded people on yeah. the internet. But you don't get these large-scale media reports. You don't get the... So we, we've basically created electronic segregation. In a way, that's right. Mm. Yes, that's absolutely right. So this is one of the reasons why this is thought to have been an effect. That There are others that uh, some of these researchers point to. One is the dramatic change. I mean, it was a total change in our outlook uh, with 9-11, that uh, 9-11 kind of brought a lot of us to our senses in the sense that people believing in, in um, alien abductions suddenly had something else to concentrate on, which yeah. was we knew was very, very real. And maybe it focused our minds in a sort of global sense. Just a few more polls, though. There is still a large number of people, and, and again, these are American statistics, 56% of Americans believed in UFOs. Now, that means unidentified flying objects, mm. and that does not necessarily mean aliens. But the belief in UFOs is very, very prevalent, that there is something that we don't understand, whatever it is. And, and I think, actually, science takes a fairly sanguine view of this as well, that we look at UFO reports, and most of them turn out to be... Actually, most of them turn out to be the planet Venus, but a lot of them turn out to be other things as well. But there seems to be a handful that defy any kind of rational explanation and and you and I have spoken about some of those before, some of these um, remarkable results that have come from the US military, where they've seen things moving very rapidly across the sky. We talked about pilots. Uh, I think I put it down to military activity. I think at the end of the day, that's what we decided it might have been. Mm. So that's almost certainly where most of these things will end up. But it is interesting that a large number of people are prepared to have an open mind about UFOs. Open, yeah, uh, and uh, we have to, you know, on the other side of the coin, there are, there are certainly a, a handful of unexplained phenomena involved yeah. in alien abduction cases. So, you know... There might be a reasonable explanation, but we don't know what it is. That's right. But it draws me to something you and I talked about years and years ago, and that is the potential for intelligent life other than that on Earth, you know, assuming we're intelligent. But um, we, I think you and I talked about it quite some time ago. What, what are the odds in, in terms of the development of the universe and the age of the universe and the expansion of the universe, what are the odds of an intelligent race uh, developing and coexisting in the universe with us and being technolo technologically advanced enough not only to find us but to visit us. And at the same time as we're around. Yes. That's, that's yes, a crucial exactly. thing. Yeah. The thinking among astrobiologists is now that higher order species, and by that I mean uh, anything other than a single-celled organism, uh, while single-celled organisms might be relatively commonplace throughout the universe, and hopefully we'll find the answer to that soon, mm. the transition to get from a single-celled organism up to a higher-order life form, and let alone a vertebrate, but something with multi-cells, that's apparently seen as very difficult. We know it only happened once on the Earth, for example. Yeah. Uh, we are all directly descended from something called the last universal common ancestor. And if it's been as rare as that on Earth, where conditions are absolutely ideal for the development of life, we've got, you know, the moon stabilising the Earth's rotation and tides... Uh, kind of washing the, the, um, the ocean chores. All of that sort of stuff seems to be conducive to the development and evolution of life. And that some of those features could be quite rare. So people are now thinking, well, intelligent species within the universe may be so far apart, so rare, that they're never going to be able to know about each other. You know, if, if we've got a, a species on the other side of the universe that existed um, half a billion years ago, we're not going to know about it. Yeah. Uh, and that's a fairly depressing picture. It is, rather, and but, uh, probably yeah. suggests that we're just going to have to learn to live alone. Well, I think it means we've got to learn to look after ourselves and, yeah, and well. guard the planet that we're, we, are, um, we, are, we inhabit. That's Dr. Fred Watson, an astronomer with the Department of Science, speaking with Andrew Dunkley on our sister program, Space Nuts. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Still to come, the science report and growing concerns that COVID-19 can be spread simply through breathing and talking and new warnings that Arctic summer sea ice could disappear before 2050 due to the growing impact of climate change. All that and more still to come on Space Time.
And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. There are growing concerns that the COVID-19 virus can be spread simply through breathing and talking, and not just through coughs and sneezes as previously thought. It's already known that people sneezing and coughing can spread the virus up to a metre or more, infecting others nearby. That's why 1.5 to 2 metre social distancing is being encouraged. Mucus and other fluids attached to these respiratory droplets weigh them down, causing them to fall to the ground over longer distances. But new research by the University of Nebraska has found COVID-19 viral DNA in far smaller, lighter bioaerosols, which are less than 5 microns in diameter. Now, particles this small can travel much further, floating in the air for far longer, possibly even hours, and consequently, they can wind up depositing on a far wider range of surfaces. Scientists say it's this speech and breath-related spread which could help explain why asymptomatic people can spread the virus. The new findings support a systematic review published in the Journal of Infectious Diseases by scientists with the University of New South Wales and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, which looked at all the available literature on the horizontal distance travelled by respiratory droplets. They found that all the available scientific evidence doesn't support the assumption that contamination from symptomatic patients would only occur within a 1-2 to two metre safe distance. Instead, 10 studies found respiratory droplets and aerosols of various sizes emanating from people, 80% of which were transported more than 2 and even as far as 8 metres from the person emitting them. A new study suggests that drying your hands with paper towels is better at removing viruses than hot air hand dryers. The findings, reported by the European Congress on Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases, follows a British study showing that hands dried on paper towels spread less virus to other surfaces when compared to hands dried with hot air hand dryers. Researchers deliberately contaminated four people's hands with a harmless virus and then looked at which drying method was better able to get rid of viruses and stop them being spread onto other surfaces. They found average surface contamination was over 10 times higher after using a hot air hand dryer compared to those who used paper towels. A new study by scientists from Flinders University to coincide with Earth Day has highlighted the plight of some of the planet's most vulnerable creatures and also shortfalls in most conservation efforts. More than birds and most mammals, amphibians, including frogs and salamanders, are on the front line of extinction in a hotter, drier climate where wetlands and environmental water flows are under pressure and facing inadequate management. Scientists found amphibian populations are in decline globally, with water resource use dramatically changing surface water hydrology and distribution. The report, published in the journal Conservation Biology, also found that many conservation measures simply are not enough to arrest the decline. In fact, it shows that 41% of species assessed are at threat of extinction. Much of Australia is drying as a result of climate change, water extraction and landscape modification, with multiple reports of mass death of native fish hitting the headlines last summer being a good example of the damage we're doing. A new report warns that summer Arctic sea ice is predicted to disappear before 2050, resulting in devastating consequences for the Arctic ecosystem. The grave warning, reported in the journal Geophysical Research Letters, is based on studies by 21 research institutes around the world. The North Pole is presently covered by sea ice all year round. However, global warming has meant the overall area of the Arctic Ocean now covered by ice has reduced rapidly over the past few decades. And of course, the sea ice cover is a hunting ground and habitat for polar bears and seals. The new study analysed recent results from 40 different climate models. How often the Arctic will lose its sea ice cover in the future critically depends on future CO2 emissions. If CO2 emissions are reduced rapidly, ice-free years will only occur occasionally. But with higher emissions, the Arctic Ocean will become ice-free in most years. Well, it seems COVID-19 is proving that a fool and his money are soon parted, with the pandemic bringing out all the usual kind of artists, shonks and woo merchants promoting their fake products and conspiracy theories. It's a time when you need to be aware that these products and claims like any scientific substance and the only goal is to get your money. 
Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics says the simple rule is to follow the advice of your family doctor. Obviously, with anything like this, any sort of medical emergency, there's a lot of people out there offering instant cures, people who are totally unqualified to do so. Not that even the qualified people have a cure at this stage, but there are plenty of people taking advantage of the fear and panic and the uncertainty that's around. Definitely opportunistic. The question is, are these people who are offering sort of shonky unsubstantiated treatments or cures are they genuinely believe it are they misinformed or are they opportunists or all of the above I certainly you can get a pretty good uh, combination of people uh, across those three different aspects to see who they are a couple of examples there was a woman who's a kinesiologist which is one of the people who sort of makes you stand and stick your arms out and see if they can push you over a kinesiologist that sounds like she's definitely a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> and it's applied kinesiology too. Oh, it's, even it's better. What they do. So it's even better. So it's even Those more made up words are always a giveaway, aren't they? So these are people who uh, you probably see them everywhere. They they say stand here, put your arm out, and they push down your arm and, and you fall over. And then they say try it again now that you know I can see you. Uh, with energies, etc. Now try it again and I can't push you down. Mainly because the second time you prepare for it and you don't give in as quickly and the person who's pushing you down is pushing you in a different direction. So you're not going down. But this was someone who could do assessments of this uh, for you, but over the phone. Oh, there you go. And like $5 a minute or something? <laughs> $1 a minute. Oh, bargain basement price. I know, which is actually less than her normal price of $2.50 a minute. So, I mean, it is bargain basement, but she's obviously doing it out of the goodness of her heart because basically oh. it's to check energetically, so energetically check your respiratory system in depth over the phone. Right, so she's um, picking up the quantum waves and all this. There's definitely quantum in there. I think that's a lot of quantum. But the, the idea of the plan is that so uh, you can stop the unnecessary worry and deal with what is real, which I think is probably... <laughs> and that is... That's wonderful stuff. The trouble is the people responded to this outraged, objected furiously to this thing, saying it's uh, it, it's shonky stuff. And if it's not a Facebook page, and that was taken down pretty quickly. But she's not the only one. There, there's a lot of the people doing this. Uh, former Bent Spoon skeptics, Bent Spoon winner, who runs a, a site called Homeopathy Plus, was spruiking a conspiracy that a couple of homeopaths have found a, a cure for um, COVID-19. But of course, instantly their their findings were suppressed and taken down. Yeah. Yeah, but it, mm. certainly the the site she linked to it doesn't exist anymore. Big but Pharma didn't like it. I take it. Most of these are still out there. Most of these claims are, are still out there that uh, people aren't being taken down, and this sort of has outraged a lot of skeptics as well. So you, you, you reach the stage where you think seriously, let's do something about this. Let's let's get these yeah, let's fight back against these uh, things. But the latest one I just saw was someone who's promoting the coronavirus. The, the virus doesn't exist. It's actually um, 5G radiation, which is causing these illnesses, which the governments can turn on and off just to control you, almost to sort of threaten you, that they can sort of make you sick, make you well, make you sick, make you well. And you think there's nothing in it. There's actually nothing in it, but there's, there's a gazillion people out there who are making sort of similar conspiracy claims, false product claims, cures, all sorts of things. Um, well, the other week we were talking about the uh, the noodles causing it, weren't we? Noodles cause coronavirus? That's known. That's the, the, it wasn't just the noodles. It's also yakult, <laughs> causing yeah, coronavirus. Right. Yakult and uh, all sorts of things. Yeah, me goring noodles, which is not made in China. Neither is yakult, and all sorts of things. Wagyu beef, which is scary. That's also not made in China, or at least not the, a lot of the love stuff that's grown in Australia. But yeah, there's a claim for everything. You can always find uh, someone putting forward some sort of particular claim. It doesn't take long to find a lot of this stuff. That's the trouble. Everyone's out there putting this stuff forward, and there's no filter on what's reasonable and what's not reasonable and what's a kinesiologist. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is broadcast on Science Zone Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. and through both iHeartRadio and on TuneIn Radio. Or you can subscribe and download Space Time as a free podcast through Apple, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, Audio Boom, Podbeam, Android, Castbox, from Spacetime with Stuart Gary.com, or from your favorite download podcast provider. You can help support the show and the work we do by visiting the Spacetime online shop and grabbing yourself a few goodies, or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to commercial free double episode versions of the show, as well as bonus audio content and other rewards. Just go to our Patreon page through spacetimewithstuartgary.com for all the details. 
If you want more space time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 